Hello, my name is Stephanie James and I'm the director and curator for the Mott Warsh Collection, an MW gallery based in Flint, Michigan. This privately owned but publicly shared fine arts collection is among the largest in the country with a focus on art by artists of the African diaspora and others who reflect on it. With education at the core of its mission, the collection lends art to Flint-based public institutions, touring, museum, and college exhibitions, and the collection does educational programming. Today's program is the second in a series of art talks offered in conjunction with the exhibit Examining Identity Construction Selections from the Mott Warsh Collection currently on view here at MW Gallery. The exhibit explores the social and political dynamics of identity with a focus on the visual representation of African Americans as seen through the artworks of over 30 influential artists of the 20th and 21st centuries. Uh, artists such as Emma Amos, Elizabeth Catlett, Kahinda Wiley, Nick Cave, uh, Pat Ward Williams, Carrie Mae Weems, and many, many more. Today we'll be speaking with Whitfield Lavelle, one of the influential artists who is featured prominently in this exhibit. Whitfield Lavelle is an internationally renowned contemporary artist whose work documents and pays tribute to the daily lives of anonymous African Americans. He creates drawings in pencil, oil stick, conti crayon, or charcoal on paper, wood, or directly on walls, and pairs these images with found objects to create elegant, poetic, and intricately con constructed tableau. The images are inspired by pictures from Lavelle's archive of photographs, tintypes, and old postcards from the turn of the 20th century to the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement. The found objects are usually everyday items, yet they are historically symbolic, like playing cards, ropes, flags, and jewelry. When brought together, they suggest narratives and themes about family, identity, gender, love, loss, and the passage of time. Hello, Whitfield. Hello. How are you? I'm fine. Good, good, good. I'm so glad we're finally getting together to have this talk. So, so much, and thank you for inviting me. Yeah. So how, how are things uh, going in New York for you? Everyone's, you know, we're all having our own special time in each of our states. Well, I'm pretty much staying indoors, uh, uh, working in my studio and doing home improvements, <laughs> trying to take advantage of this, you know, time to just be quiet you know a little bit of downtime yeah, yeah. yeah. but I, I i try to go out uh walking every now and then oh good but, um things have things have been very very strange <laughs> yeah no strange is probably the most googled or most used word i guess i would say these days that it crops up in everyone's uh, post, strange mm -hmm. times. Well, well, listen, over the um, course of this next hour, um, I'm looking for you to talk about your development as an artist. Um, give us, share with us a little bit about your background, some of your early influences, your process, anything, anything else you wanna share. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I'm, I'm going to, I may stop you at certain points to interject thoughts or a question. 
and then at the end of the in, end of um, the session, we'll have some questions that have been submitted by our public um, uh, staff and friends of the Mott Warsh collection and followers of the uh, collection that we'll try to squeeze in as well. Okay. So, yeah, so you've put together a great array of images to accompany this talk and I've got my clicker in hand. So, let's begin. Oh, okay. <clears throat> well, the first image is a photograph of my grandmother, Mary Jane Glover. Uh, she um, had her hair bobbed and came to visit her aunt in Harlem and posed for this photo at a, 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 um, a photography studio. My grandparents were from South Carolina on my mother's side, and my father's parents were from Barbados in the West Indies. Uh -huh. And I spent a lot of time growing up looking at photographs and learning about my people, learning about who my relatives were and my ancestors based on my grandmother's photographs. Mm -hmm. right? Do you know um, how old she was when this photograph was She was, was 19 taken? in that photo. Mm -hmm. And I'd say that was 1924 or something like that. Mm -hmm. She yeah. lived to be uh, uh, 97. Wow, that's wonderful. I'm sure you carried a lot of stories then from her. She was one of my best teachers. Mm -hmm. She, as well as my, my, my mother. Um, she taught me all about the South mm -hmm. and about life. Um, and she actually taught me how to go flea marketing and enjoy collecting junk, mm -hmm. which eventually that practice found its way into my work. So I, I have to, to thank my, my grandma for that. Yeah, I was going to uh, ask, I know that you have said on occasion you sort of described your, um, yourself as being, your family as, or yourself as coming from a bicultural family because uh, your, your mother, as you said, was from South Carolina and your father was from the Caribbean. Um, I, I'm just curious, um, well, can you talk about the similarities and differences uh, in the cultures and how that informed the person that you have come to be? Well, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the similarities, there were a lot of similarities in that my father's uh, generation represented the sort of immigrant uh, group that wanted to fit in with American culture. Mm -hmm. However, everything aesthetically, culturally, and uh, um, just, you know, in terms of food and likes and dislikes were very different. And I always noticed a difference. They were um, uh, whereas my my southern family had an aesthetic that was about you know um, simple wood handmade furniture patchwork quilts um, uh, you know old steamer trunks that sort of thing 
And my father's side of the family had a, a brownstone up in Harlem and chandeliers and, you know, fancy armoires and uh, furnishings and fancy china. It was sort of like, a, oh, I guess, you know, sort of uh, like a, maybe a more nouveau riche kind of a, of a, of a British uh, aesthetic mm -hmm. that they brought over from Barbados. And of course, the food was very different. Yeah. <laughs> Both imagine. grandmothers were incredible cooks, but the West Indian food was the, just amazing. And the Southern cuisine, they, they were both amazing, but just as different as night and day. So interesting. And the music as well. Mm hmm Mm -hmm. This is um, this is an image of some uh, crayon portrait enlargements, which I became interested in. The one in the center in the silver frame is my grandmother's aunt. So that's my grandmother who you just saw. That's uh, a, a photograph of her aunt, which was hand touched with charcoal. So when you look at it, you can almost not tell if it's a photograph or, it's, or if it's a, um, um, a drawing. But that's yeah. because at that time, which would have been like the turn of the 20th century, they didn't have mechanical enlargers. And so the photographers had to make a very faint impression onto a piece of board and then draw in the details. Wow, so, that's so interesting. Yeah, I, and, and, and I, I was so attracted to that and so fascinated by the family stories that my grandmother told me that I finally, mm, you know, talked her into letting me have that. And that led to me collecting about a uh, uh, hundred such uh, bubble glass portraits and, you know, portraits that have hand coloring or uh, that are, are partially hand drawn with charcoal. You know, these are wonderful. I, I have seen one or two in my own family as well. Mm -hmm. uh, bubble glass portraits. Well, I wish I had enough room to put up all of the, the pieces that I own, but they're in storage right now. Mm. This, this particular photo was from uh, an installation at the Andy Warhol Museum. Mm where I was exhibiting some of my works alongside of some of the things I collect because Andy Warhol was a big collector of things. I see. And so you can really see how my collections uh, uh, influence what I, what I create. Mm -hmm. And here are some of the types of photographs that I work from. Now, let me explain. I, uh, my father was a, 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 an accomplished self-taught photographer. Mm -hmm. And I helped him out in his dark room uh, from the time I was like five years old. And so photographs played a large uh, role in my visual, my appreciation of visual imagery, and mm -hmm. also in understanding and, and learning about history. I don't have any of my father's photographs here, unfortunately, but these are some of the ones I collect. These two are called cabinet cards. 
they're um, mounted on board, uh, stiff board. And that's the kind of card that someone would send home to their family and uh, it would usually be displayed in a china cabinet or uh, something like that. Next. About what size would they be? Uh, about five by seven hmm. or, or maybe five by eight. And here's one from uh, the 1800s and it was taken on West 14th Street in New York which is right around the corner from my house. These are daguerreotypes, which were developed on to glass. And uh, very collectible, very special. And this is from my personal collection of tintypes, which were um, after daguerreotypes, which were very fragile, they began to uh, print the images onto tin. And they also framed them in those beautiful little uh, gold trimmed boxes. Um, but I started collecting tintypes around uh, 2001. And are these um, sort of about wallet size? I'm trying to imagine yes. the size. Okay. Yes. How I envision them. Mm -hmm. So I worked from my father's photographs for a good um, 10 to 15 years. And a lot of the images were autobiographical and <clears throat> allegorical of the lives of the people in the photographs. You know, my father took a lot of photographs of family and uh, family gatherings and weddings and such. And uh, when I was, um, I guess it was back in the early 90s, I went to Italy and I uh, spent two months in a villa, which was outside of Milan. Uh, next slide. Mm -hmm. And I learned while I was there about the history of the villa, which was grand and luxurious, but it had been built by a slave trader. Uh, an Italian slave trader. Uh, and so I decided to uh, make these drawings on directly onto the walls that would allude to the issue of the slave trade. Next. Was this the first time that you began drawing on walls, uh, doing, putting you drawings on the wall it surface? <laughs> it, it, it was, but I have to tell you a little story though. When <laughs> I was a toddler, there's a, 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 a favorite story that my parents loved to tell, was that when I was a toddler, I got the crayons and I drew all of the wall uh, in the living room. Oh my. And the door. And they had a discussion about it. And they, they said, well, let's not uh, punish him because who knows, he might grow up to be an artist. <laughs> so they just cleaned the, the, the wall down and they never said anything to me about it. Wow. So I like the fact that drawing on walls has become such a big part of my, my uh trajectory as uh, as an adult. Yes, that is uh, wonderful. And how and fortunate it, you were. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and I don't know if I mentioned that I grew up in the Bronx, 
Oh. And I, um, I spent most of my summers, or many of my summers, down in South Carolina with my grandfather. Uh, and, and this was around the civil rights uh, uh, era, um, the end of segregation as they knew it, and uh, um, around the time that Martin Luther King was killed. And so I had a very rich first-hand look at the remnants of the Old South and the, the, um, the effects of slavery uh, mm -hmm. on, on the culture, which I knew the culture through my grandparents in New York, but here I was seeing where they had come from and made quite quite a indelible impression on me. I see. And I didn't, I didn't actually um, learn about my Bayesian, my Barbados West Indian heritage until I was about maybe eight or nine. Mm. My aunt from Barbados uh, who grew up there came to visit and, and suddenly my there was like this renaissance of West Indian culture. And I, I knew that my grandmother, my paternal grandmother spoke differently. She had an accent and her cooking was different and their aesthetic was different. But I, I didn't quite understand it until I met my aunt. She got off the plane and she said hello to us and, and we, I, my sister and I thought she was speaking another language because we didn't understand what she was saying. And she spent several months with us and then we started um, having regular introductions to extended family members from my West Indian side um, um, of, of family and going to uh, concerts to hear the Calypso, the, uh, the Mighty Sparrow and um, getting more familiar with the food, flying fish and uh, uh, sorrow, which is a drink they make from a, from a, a red leaf, mm -hmm. um, mangoes, anakis. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, sounds like you had a wonderful, rich cultural awakening and, and heritage that you come from. Um, and to experience that at an early age must, must have been really special. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, dancing was a, was a big, major part of, of uh, social gatherings for us. Mm -hmm. My grandparents on my mother's side did not dance. They, um, they, they uh, grew up in a, a sort of religious um, uh, rural farm environment where mm -hmm. dancing and uh, that sort of thing, uh, going out to juke joints, which was uh, frowned upon. And, you know, so I had a lot of things to sort out because there were different cultures and different attitudes about things. Yes, yes. And uh, all of my cousins from Barbados, uh, oh, we can go to the next slide. Okay. All of my cousins from Barbados began to come and visit. And so we all became like, you know, a big, close-knit 
happy family, but there was the West Indian family and there was the African American family. And the two didn't always mix. You know, they didn't they didn't always like each other, you know, especially the um sometimes the uh African Americans were a little uh hesitant about those island people who talk <laughs> funny and eat funny food. <laughs> So anyway, the next slide is um, of Project Row Houses in Houston. Houston. Uh -huh. Now, after doing those wall drawings in Villa Villeme mm -hmm. in uh, Italy, I was looking for an opportunity to work directly on the wall, but I didn't want to force it. I didn't you know, want to uh, just come home and draw on the wall. For, I wanted a reason. And so <clears throat> I was invited to Rice University uh, to be an artist in residence for a year. And within a month, Rick Lowe from Project Row Houses invited me to do a house. Mm -hmm. uh, there are 13 houses, half of them are uh, sh um, living spaces for single mothers, and the other, uh, the other ones are um, used for rotating artist installation. So if you move to the next slide, you'll see the, um, the image that I did. I went around, um, uh, Houston to antique stores and looked for photographs of people from the area. Next. Mm -hmm. And I drew them directly on the wall with charcoal. Mm -hmm. That was the beginning of my working on wood. And I really liked the, the, uh, the idea of working on wood because Charcoal is actually burnt wood. And so it's almost like, you know, uh, bringing two it states back of the same sources. medium. Yes. Yeah, two different states. Mm -hmm. Next yeah. slide. And there was a room with uh, which you could not enter, but if you move to the next slide, you'll see that, oh, well, that's the church woman by the window. Move to the next slide. You cannot enter that room, but it was the one room that was still papered when I entered the house and uh, meaning wallpapers. And so I went out looking for furnishings and personal effects to sort of bring that room into the context of a living space within this abandoned uh, ruin of a, of a, a relic of the house sure yeah. okay and um is there another in this series before i mm, i don't know maybe oh yes oh, that's one of the wall drawings mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i actually took this wall out i pried the planks out and I exhibited some of them in New York City. And that encouraged me to continue working on vintage lumber. So okay. the works you will see, uh, which I call tableau, are actually pieces that I think of as like walls from old houses or pieces, chunks out of old houses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask, um, 
you know, Project Row House is a wonderful program. I'm familiar with it. And, but I wondered with an, an installation venue like that, what happens when that exhibit is over? What happens to the uh, drawings in this case, because your work is integrated onto the wall itself? Okay, I can tell you the short <laughs> theoretical story and then I can tell you the, the actually what happened. Okay. Now, theoretically, the next artist gets to come in and totally change everything. If they want, they can paint over the walls. Uh, they can, uh, you know, totally redo everything, but um, while the exhibition was up, it was so well received that a lawyer, a local lawyer came in and wanted to buy one of the drawings. Mm. It was one of the full figure images that you see in the first slide. The, and and mm -hmm. so I talked to Rick Lowe about it, the idea of selling it, and I would give a donation to the uh, to the the project. And also, um, I had a carpenter come and find vintage lumber to replace the planks that were oh. taken off the walls. And so Rick decided for the just the legacy of the drawings that still remain there that no artist would ever paint over them. Ah. If they wanted a clean wall, they would put up paper or something, but uh, there are still a few drawings that are still there uh, since this was done in 1995. Wow, that's wonderful. Okay, I, was, I wondered about that. Mm -hmm. um. So this one is, this is a, a tableau mm -hmm. and they're referred to as tableau because they incorporate the drawings on wood panels and uh, found objects. Mm -hmm. Now this one is of my grandmother. Mary Jane Glover, uh, from a, a, a photo of her, obviously, at, an, an, at a, a, a later date. And this is the only image I have done over the past, uh, I guess, 20 years of, of, of someone that I, I actually know. I choose to use images from found photographs because that frees me up to uh, to be um, a little less tied to the narrative of the of this person's life, and also. Um, I see the people from the found photographs as being like stand-ins for the ancestors that I will never know. Very interesting. These, this one is called libations. And those are um, pictures on the platform. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother did live to see this. Mm -hmm. uh, on exhibit at the Newberger Museum, and she was very, very excited. Very, she was a very shy, uh, soft-spoken woman, but she was going around telling strangers, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> that's a beautiful story. This one, <laughs> I can't re always remember the names of my pieces, but this was one of my early tableau pieces, and it's in a deep box. 
uh, the outside of the box is painted green, so it sits out from the wall. And mm. so I made the drawing of the man inside, and then I sat and I looked at it, and I let the man's visage speak to me. And I, so, I, so I began to um, place objects into the box that I felt would somehow um, work. And, you know, I put this, this bottle, I put the shot glass, I put the can of tobacco, and, and, and everything was working. And then I, I had a little miniature Bible, and I put the, the, the Bible into the, the foreground there. And I looked at the man's face and he was like, no, mm -mm. So, <laughs> so I, that's how I let, you know, I, I let the, the, the images and the, um, and the, the objects. objects dictate, you know, what works with what and what kind of narratives are being discovered. I see you're really communicating with the um, with the individuals depicted, yes. huh? Yes. Yeah. And this is called Eight Rock. That's uh, those figures are life size, but I'll, I, I mean in that they're they're tall men, so they're. Uh, larger than life size because I'm not that tall. So I see they're about six feet tall, each of them. Next slide. This one is called Wreath. Next. So, okay. Uh, a woman from Havana, Cuba, who was the director of the Havana Biennale, saw my work at Project Grow Houses, and she invited me to come to Cuba in 1997, I think, or, or 98, to make an installation for the exhibition. Uh, next. This is in the barracks of uh, 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 17 uh, or 18th century uh, military fort in Old Havana. And the only thing that I brought with me were some photos and some charcoal because I like to travel to the location, learn what I can about the location, and then do something that sort of um, is inspired by, by that travel. And it was not easy finding antique furniture in Havana because, you know, the... Uh, the people in in particularly on, in old Havana, they don't they don't have <clears throat> antique stores. They're they're using their antiques. So I had to sort of borrow some furnishings from some people's homes. Next, it was a long cylindrical space with this, this uh, very high ceilings next mm -hmm. what was it about the space that spoke to you um well i i had to respond to the space they gave me mm. and i this is a, a bit abstract perhaps but I was thinking of the the uh, the walk from the doorway 
to the table as sort of like walking into a church and mm -hmm. walking to an altar. Uh. And, you know, because it, it had that long uh, aisle uh, sure. feel. And so there was, there needed to be something to occupy the space in the center. And I found this huge ship chain that was uh, on the grounds, and I asked them to bring it to me. It was it weighed a ton, and it took like five or six men to to carry it, and they threw it down on the floor, and exactly where they placed it is where it stayed. Next. And uh, this is the table, the one centerpiece that I uh, that I that I created like a focal point for the installation. It included this uh, funeral program, which is open in the center of the table. Uh, that I that I found, and everything else was was found or borrowed from uh, from people I met in Havana, mm -hmm. and and the program is sitting on a, a, a pile of real flowers. See. Next. Okay, so back home in New York City, mm -hmm. I began to make these pieces, tableau, with uh, old barn wood and charcoal and found objects. So going to the flea markets, which is something I learned how to do as a child, became a, a, a weekly activity for me. Every Saturday morning I was at the flea market looking for things that inspired me. This one um, is called Bringer and the, uh, the attachments are uh, oil lamps. Mm -hmm. Next. Ah. And here is uh, just an example of how I do my drawings. I do them by hand. Mm -hmm. I um, uh, apply the charcoal and then I rub with my finger to get the tones and I also uh, use an eraser to take out the highlights. So I'm going back and forth between applying the, the black and rubbing it off. I'm, I'm erasing it out, erasing the light out. Now this is a great time to talk about process. What's the tool in your hand? Well, that is a crayon holder made of brass and that is a little piece of black Conte crayon. Conte crayon is like really fancy, high quality uh, charcoal. The, um, I use that, 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 that tool holder because you know, the, the charcoal is, um, you know, whatever, $5 a stick. And I always drop, drop it and it breaks into like five pieces. <laughs> so yes. I, I put them in the holder and use the small pieces. Uh, and I, I also, you can't see it, but I will have an eraser in between my other fingers. So I'm going constantly going back back and forth between putting in and erasing out. The striations that I'm seeing over the face, are those 
um, added? Is that added by you, or is that the wood grain coming through? That's the wood grain. That is the wood grain coming through. Yes. Wonderful. And there are some parts of the wood that uh, is naturally oilier or, um, I don't know, may, may be rougher because of the, the wallpaper paste that was on it previously. So you see that like black spot on the right side of his cheek? Right under his Yeah, eye. there is something, and on his forehead, right, there are some things that just happen because that's the natural way that the, 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 the wood absorbs the charcoal. And I like going with that. I like sure. letting that happen. If it's too distracting, then I can really get the eraser and erase it down uh, so that it uh, does not become a problem. But it's, it's, it's a pleasure. The, um, if you look into the left eye or uh, the eye on the left, his right eye, there is a nail which Ooh. is how the wallpaper was attached to the to the the wood when it was in the house and so i like to leave the the, the nails so these natural flex and what some might consider to be a flaw in the found piece become truly a, a part of the work itself yes because I'm working with historical images and the wood has history already. And the wood comes from old houses where uh, old souls once inhabited. So I think that, you know, allowing the wood to have its character is very important. And that, you know, you just think about who hammered that nail in, you know? Would they have ever thought that some artist would then take that piece of wood and be drawing, you know, a, a face on it? I, 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 I sort of get into that kind of thinking. Sure, no, it, it, it's clear that your selection your selections of the individual found pieces that e you either attach or are working on the surface of are, um, aren't just casual. The selection of them isn't casual, that you've put a lot of thought into uh, matching up the, the image with a certain piece of, um, of history. And this one is called Wise Like That. I like using titles that are not, um, how do you say, uh, titles that are open-ended and, and, and mm -hmm. leave a little poetic uh, feel to the interpretation of the work. Wise Like That is an old blues tune, which I listen to a lot of old uh, Lomax uh, field recordings while I'm working. And, you know, like early staple singers music. So um, this, this piece is uh, at the Metropolitan um, mm -hmm. Museum of Art in New York. Next. And this one is called Bliss. <laughs> Those uh, um, those shot glasses have real whiskey in them. <laughs> and the decanters have whiskey, so the aroma of the of the alcohol I feel is part of the, the artwork. You know, the the, the, the sensory um, 
I like to engage the senses, all of the senses, whenever possible. Next. And this is called hope. All of those preserved jars have symbolic items in them. And that's at the Hunter Museum in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Next. This is called Dusk. It, uh, uh, that is uh, charcoal, or coal, sorry, coal, which is oh, yes. different. <laughs> and uh, that's in New Orleans. Next. This one is called Potion. Mm. Wonderful expression on the subject's face. Mm -hmm. oh, this one is, uh, it's called Tell Them I'm Flying, mm. which is from an old uh, traditional uh, slave song mm. made famous by Odetta. And that is a, a quilt which I attached at the bottom and I just, uh, I just loved the quality and the age of the quilt and what it says and, and uh, how it resonates with the image of the man. Next. Sure, adds another uh, wonderful, um, textural, uh, uh, different textural quality to the work. Mm -hmm. This is my installation called Whispers from the Walls. It was created in Denton, Texas back in 1999. I was invited to come to the University of North Texas and I was given carte blanche to do anything I wanted which is a wonderful thing <laughs> to have. And it's an artist's so dream. I, <laughs> so I, I researched the town of Denton and learned about um, a community called Quaker Town, which was flourishing back in the 19, uh, the late 1800s up until 1923 when the the residents were forced to to leave their homes next the reason they gave for uh taking uh um moving this community was that they needed a city park and in the, the, uh, the records, actually, the historical records um, uh, show that they did not want this community to be adjacent to a white women's college, um, which is why they wanted the black community out. out. Next. And so I created this installation in homage to that community, Quakertown. I went to a photo archive in Dallas and found uh, photos of people from the area. You know, Dallas is about a half an hour from Denton. And, uh, and while the students were actually building the house and, you know, hammering the floorboards and whatever. Uh, I was out shopping, looking for things that were reminiscent of that time period. Next. And you know, what I used as my mental mo model for this was my, my great aunt, Fanny lived 
in a shack up the hill from my grandfather's sister when I was a child. And she wore, uh, she was in her mid, well, she lived to be 105. So I guess she was in her mid to late uh, 90s when, when I, I used to go and visit her up that hill. And she lived in a, sh in a, uh, a shack that was similar to this. Everything was raw wood and uh, uh, she had no electricity. She didn't like uh, electric lights because she said that they hurt her eyes. And she wore a long Victorian dress and she always had her hair, her head wrapped with a sort of like a, a turban. And so I modeled the placements of the furnishings and the objects next, based on my memory of her house. Sure. Yes, wonderful how childhood memories, the, the memories can uh, come into play in later times in our lives, and especially mm -hmm. I mean, it's uh, for um, a creative person. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at that time when I was eight years old, uh, the first time I went down there, um, I was fascinated. I went into a lot of houses that were set up just this way. Everyone had a steamer trunk at the foot of their bed. Uh. What was inside of it? A patchwork quilts with mothballs, mm -hmm. and you know, it was it was uh, in the Bronx. My grandparents always had a steamer trunk at the foot of their bed. You see, so so it was similar, but it was it it became clear to me where my grandparents aesthetic came from. Next. Uh -huh. And um, we actually um, got the okay from a couple of banks that were uh, demolishing old houses and they allowed the, the students to come and collect the shingles. So these shingles uh, came from a number of different houses that were demolished then while I was there. Mm -hmm. And uh, next. Mm -hmm. Oh, next again. Next. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is, a, this is a, a, a tableau which I uh, put together and, and uh, the, the record player actually spins and I had a recording that emanates from that record player of, uh, of an old blues tune. I Next. see. So again, the multi-sensory experience. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And I covered the floor with clothing. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually put out... Um, uh, like a newsletter asking for people to bring old clothing in and we were just inundated with clothes. And, and, and I also got them to use mulch because the floor in the gallery was like terrazzo floor, flooring. Mm -hmm. And there was no way that I could really, um, affect the experience of n being in a different place and a different time with the floor the way it was. And so yeah. I thought of how, you know, I thought this would be evocative to have this sea of clothing surrounding the, uh, the house. And, so, and, and, and really once, the viewer stepped into the gallery, 
they had to walk across the clothes. Uh -huh. And when someone stepped in onto the clothing, they became part of the installation. And they, their, their senses were heightened because they were paying special attention to where they were stepping. And the, you know, there, there were smells and sounds and such that really sort of removed the experience from being in a gallery space. Sure. And it, 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 it transports you to a, a different uh, mindset. I see. And okay, after uh, the uh, whispers from the walls had uh, um, actually, it was built to come apart and be reassembled, and it went to 15 different venues across the country. One of them was the Seattle Art Museum. And this piece, uh, which I call Walking Blues, is uh, one of the pieces that, um, the, uh, as a result of, the, um, of them displaying whispers from the walls, they purchased this tableau from my studio. Wonderful. Ah, I recognize this piece. Yes, this is called, is it Face? Yes. Okay. This is one of the, I think, first pieces that the Mott Walsh uh, Foundation purchased. And uh, it's <clears throat> really the, the, the use of the, the mammy and the pappy images was strategically, uh, they were turned around on purpose because, you know, we, we rarely uh, pay attention to the someoneness of the, the um, how do you say, the um, service workers and um, uh, but nowadays they call them first responders or essential workers. That's, oh, that's, okay. yeah. Yeah. We, we seldom pay attention to them. And, and unfortunately there was this whole genre of, 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 of stereotypes that uh, were demeaning of black people. And so I did this one because I wanted to, show this woman as a fully, uh, fully human and dignified person behind this, the, the, the stereotype that you ignore. I see. So really relating the, the, um, the portrait image to these um, stereotype, uh, uh, one-dimensional, almost of sorts, uh, caricatures. Right. Um, are the, car mm -hmm. the caricature is like, this is how you see me. But the image of that girl is like, this is who I am. So, you, so, so it's like saying, you don't see me for who I am. Yeah, yeah, you know, our exhibit, um, Examining Identity Construction here in the gallery, is organized around three sub-themes, uh, confronting racist stereotypes, everyday people, and taking a stand. And I have this particular work placed in the confronting racist stereotypes section, uh, but it is quite different from its counterparts there. Um, we're, with the counterparts, they tend to emphasize the caricature images 
um, from pop culture as a way of, um, well, um, presenting them more explicitly as a way of condemning the stereotype. Mm -hmm. But um, it's interesting, as you've explained, you know, your decision to um, turn their faces to the wall and for us to see their backs. And it truly is the, the, um, the image of the beautif beautifully rendered portrait of this woman really overwhelms the um, figurines below. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's see. This one is called Strive. Mm -hmm. And those are boxing gloves. This piece is at the <clears throat> Harvard uh, Business School. Now, the objects that I choose to incorporate with my, my drawn image always have some sort of significance, not always a literal significance, but a broader significance. I purposely put these boxing gloves with the image of a woman because I did not want people to say, oh, he's a boxer. So that's why they're a boxer boxing gloves. I wanted people to reflect on what do the boxing gloves represent. And to me, they represent perseverance. They represent um, strength and the battles, the daily battles that we encounter as a people. And in, 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 in the, the um, in the, the act of striving, one must put their boxing gloves and fight their way through. Mm. Yeah, that's very profound. Oops, sorry. This one is called having. Uh, <clears throat> Each of those boxes has been filled with pennies. I could tell you stories about how I acquired so many pennies, but um, you know, you go to the bank and you ask for pennies and they'll give you like, you know, $5 minimum. And so I had all these assistants and all these family members going to their banks, getting pennies. But <clears throat> um, I, was, I, I was thinking here about the importance of acquiring wealth and self-sufficiency. And therefore, the, uh, the boxes of pennies. The, um, the box on the right side uh, by the seated woman's knee is upside down, but the, the printing says, always insist on having. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's the, um, it's the, they're talking about always insist on having this brand of champagne. But I liked the 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 the, the way that the it, the the word having was there, and so I decided to call the piece having. Uh huh. And that 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 sits in Oprah Winfrey's office for the past uh, fifteen years. Lovely. This is America. Hmm? And this is rumor. 
Mm -hmm. um, sort of, uh, it's sort of um, the company you keep and the chair representing uh, social gatherings and such. Mm -hmm. And obviously this is also in our exhibit as, since I've chosen that as my part of my backdrop here. Mm -hmm. um, in this piece, we happen to have in the section that's um, called Everyday People. Um, mm -hmm. It's a section where I've grouped numerous works from the collection where the artists, where artists have uh, drawn inspiration from ordinary people in every, everyday situations. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think that this focus by artists really succeeds in empowering and elevating the status of ordinary people, everyday people. Um, and I just wonder if you could speak to the notion of everyday people as subject in art. Well, <clears throat> one thing I will say is that I have avoided um, making images of famous people. Mm -hmm. I never say never, but I have just been more interested in these images of, of, of uh, found images of so-called uh, anonymous people, people whose names we don't know and whose lives we don't know about. Because the fact is that one time that person walked this earth and spoke and lived and dreamed just as we're doing today. And I look, so I look for the, the humanity that I can find within each of the images that I choose to work from. What I found surprising in terms of ordinary people was that when I first started showing this work, I got a lot of comments from mostly non-Black people that, um, the, the, the people that I was, I was depicting were very wealthy. And that was based on the fact that they were stylish, well-groomed, and, you know, looking great, <laughs> which in my experience and my familial uh, history does not necessarily mean that you are wealthy. It simply means that you have style. And when you go to a photo studio to have your picture taken, you are going to dress up to be immortalized the way you want to be seen and the way you want to be remembered. Uh, <clears throat> and in general, like from, from my, 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 my parents' photos of, of their, their family members, black people just dressed up really well, even to go to picnics. And uh, uh, it, it, it had a lot to do with how they felt about themselves. And so I found it interesting because there were some people who were so put off by seeing well-dressed black people from a certain time when in their minds they expected that couldn't have been a reality. See, they expected to see them in tattered clothing mm -hmm. with no shoes on, you see? Mm -hmm. Like that, and that's another stereotype. There, there, there were were um, 
many people who were very poor and there were many people who were upwardly mobile and there were some who were entrepreneurs. Um, now, uh, another thing is I have <clears throat> in one of my boxes of photographs, I have two images of a woman, one where she's wearing her maid's outfit with the, the apron and the, the, the lace collar and another where she's dressed up in her finery. So there was one picture that she had taken to give to her employer, and there was one that was her, the way she saw herself. Mm. Yeah, it's so important to give um, the opportunity to, to see people as they see themselves and not impose um, this identity. I mean, that's the you know whole thought behind this exhibit, even just the the complexity of identities and the um, the whole notion of having you know control and the authority to um, determine who you are and how you're presented, how you're perceived, and um, yeah, yeah. My great-grandfather, Thomas Glover, had a farm in uh, Blair, South Carolina, and I have pictures of him in his overalls uh, feeding his pigs in the pig pig uh, in the pig pen or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and I also have photos of him after church where he is dressed to the nines. Mm. Okay. And so you can't always judge a book by its cover. You can't judge someone's social status by what garments they have on. Sure. Sure. No, wonderful. We're, we're um, thrilled to have this particular piece in the collection and able to show it. It's, it's um, one that gets so much attention in this particular ex exhibit. Yeah, she looks so regal, doesn't she? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And this is one of my, uh, one of my favorites as well. This is called Shine. Mm. These three hip young dudes are dressed in their uh, their their costumes. I mean, I think it, it at a certain period when when you were going out, you always wore like a, a suit. And at least in, in Harlem, when my father grew up, you know, you wore a suit jacket and a tie and you had your, your hat. And uh, so I, I, I use this image of the three of them looking like they were uh, hanging out and what they, they were actually having their picture taken. And I put the shoe shine box or, or rather, I put this box with shoeshine uh, footrests on it and uh, placed it in front. Mm -hmm. Very nice. This is an installation I made in uh, Richmond, Virginia, it's called Visitation, uh, the, the Richmond Project. And it was about Jackson Ward, which was the first major uh, entrepreneurial community in the country. 
Mm. And the, fr the, fr the, the tableau there, the, the long one, which is 23 feet long, is, uh, is um, dedicated to uh, Maggie Walker, who started the Penny Savings Bank. She was the first black woman, well, well she was the first black person and the first woman to ever found a bank. Mm -hmm. So next. Within that installation, I created this parlor. So once you enter through the curtains, you see on the next slide, I set up uh, like a, a a parlor with a few wall drawings and uh, personal um, items next. And there's an organ in the corner from which emanates uh, an old gospel tune. And I should also mention that just before you enter this parlor, there's a voice of a woman reciting all of the names of the residents of Jackson Ward from the 1920s, which was a way of saying these were real people. This is not just, you know, uh, make believe. These were actual souls who, who uh, were breathing and living their lives as we are today. Yes. And this installation traveled to a number of places, but it also went to Australia, Sydney. And at the reception, I always put on that plate in the table, I always put a, a roast chicken and collard greens and uh, candied yams. <laughs> and the Australians were very moved by it because they said that it reminded them of the way things were for their grandparents who moved to Australia. So it's not just about the black experience. You know, many people come to the work from uh, from a place like 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 a human place within themselves next and this one is called all things in time that is a, a spinning wheel mm -hmm. It's just called T. Mm -hmm. um, I cannot remember the name of this one, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I I enjoyed the uh, the, the Newell post. Like I think the it's take Newell this post. hammer. Is take, it take this hammer. Okay, now that's that is. Um, that's another uh, black folk tune. Okay, title. that's what I was thinking. Yeah. And you know, the, those, those black folk tunes take this hammer. It refers to uh, running away from slavery mm. and going toward freedom. I hope you enjoyed part one of In Conversation with Whitfield Lavelle. Check the Mott Warsh Collection website for information about part two coming soon.